sometimes we can do some of those logistical things, but I feel like when we're going through major stress, most of it can't be given to anybody else. But what we can do is sit in it and offer a pair of listening ears and offer a heart that is willing to ask, what is, what has that been like for you? And to just hold compassion and empathy. It doesn't take a lot of money. It doesn't take a lot of time. It doesn't, you know, have to take any money at all. It doesn't have to be a big grand production, but it's just those small ways that people reached out that, that felt like a lifeline, especially in the past few years, as I feel like so many of our communities that we've felt like we've been a part of previously have just crumbled underneath our feet. Katie Willis is the first person I thought of when I sat down to list the most ideal guests to host on this podcast. I love connecting with her because I always feel like she really sees me and loves me for who I am and who I'm becoming. Katie is a wife, mom, musician, and healer through the use of trauma-informed yoga and coaching, where she uses both dialogue and somatic movement. She'll be taking on new clients in the next couple of months, so if this episode resonates with you, check the show notes for how to connect with her so you can take one of those spots. Katie has faced some hard stuff, and I've watched her do it with grace and with a gift for leaning into community even as her community has needed to evolve. I want to learn to be more like her, and I so appreciate her willingness to come sit with me and share our hearts as my very first podcast guest. I was so nervous to get started with podcasting. You guys, I even curled my hair and dressed up on top. It was a Zoom fit, you know, to do this interview. I had so many butterflies, but gratefully, Katie is a calming influence. I walked away from this conversation with a better idea of how to show up for others in their trials and how to allow myself to be seen in mine. I felt so uplifted and with an increased confidence that has propelled me through seven more interviews so far with several more scheduled. So much goodness ahead and I'm so glad you are here for it. Katie, I'm so excited to have you with us today and in our inaugural episode to be able to talk about building community among women. And I just admire you so much in the way that I have seen you do this and hold space for other people and give people the opportunity to hold space for you and to do that both ways. So I'm super excited that you're here today. And I'm wondering, how are you doing today for real? Oh, I actually got asked that yesterday and I just started sobbing. The poor, it was at church, the poor congregation member, I don't think was expecting that. Um, You know, I'm hurting like hell right now. There's just a lot on my plate and a lot of really big decisions that I'm making and just some really, really heart-wrenching life experiences that I'm having. So it's a little bit intense. I don't know if this is just like going to be a straight up interview, but how are you really doing, Kristen, if I'm allowed? Oh, no, you are allowed. That is, I am, I am doing a little better than I have been. I feel like I've been kind of hiding under a rock for a couple of years after Dave, you know, was in the ICU with COVID and we thought we were going to lose it. And then it's been a very, very long recovery. I I don't think he's a hundred percent yet but he's in a much better place than he was. But, you know, there are financial ramifications. There's just like Mm -hmm. all of the global trauma we all experienced from COVID and other things that we've gone through. And I feel like I've been kind of paralyzed and just kind of stuck in this place of not being able to progress, feeling honestly like a lot of shame spiraling, which is why like this podcast is, it's, it's good for me but it's a little scary because I felt like I had all these tools and I had done an incredible amount of healing work, both Mm -hmm. physically, both emotionally. I was in a great spot and all these things came rapid fire and I kind of spiraled. And then I felt shame about that. That like, 
how could I regain weight? How could I, you know, let my sleeping habits go? How could I let myself feel paralyzed, admired, and not be moving forward on things that I know would bring me joy, but like, can't make myself do them. And I felt like I should know better. Like when those Uh, things happened to me before, because I went through other trials, I feel like, well, I've, you know, I've never really been through this level of heartache. I don't really have tools yet. So I, I gave myself a lot more grace then, but when you have a lot of tools and then you don't use them, you're like, what's wrong with me? And then it makes you feel almost like, like hypocritical, even though I didn't mean it to be, you know, a couple of years ago, I was like speaking at a retreat about cultivating habits of self-love. And then I'm like, I actually need a retreat like that, but I couldn't be a speaker because I I was living the things that I know help. And so it's been a process for me and, and actually starting this podcast is a huge healthy step forward for me to be able to say, like, actually the last couple of years have been really, really excruciatingly painful. I can move forward and find joy again. And I can give myself grace for not using the tools because I think sometimes we're in so much pain. It doesn't even matter that we have the tools. We actually just have to have space for the grief of being in that pain. Yes. I so resonate with that. And, you know, I can't speak for all of your future guests, but like right out of the gate, okay, this is going to be perfect because yes, the past few years have sent me in a spiral too. And I think we need to have more safe spaces where we can acknowledge that because otherwise I'm hearing you say, and I so resonate with that. When we are left alone to our own thoughts, we can drown in that shame and all of the should haves and all of the self-judgment. And I feel like that is one of many reasons, but a huge reason why community is so critical because we can get out of our head and we, when we have communities where we're safe, the shame and the self-judgment and all of those things that will keep us spinning or spiraling further, they lose their hold. When we have safe spaces where we can say, I need to show up as I am and be vulnerable. And can I bounce this off of people who, who will hold that and be tender about it? Then we can look at it and we're like, yeah, I still am going through this hard thing but I'm going to make it through and we've got more hope than when we're just hiding and stuck and shameful. For some reason, I think you are probably going to be the same way. If someone else were to download their life experience over the last couple of years, and it was exactly what I've been through, I would have tremendous like grace and compassion and all this space to hold for them, but it's harder to do it for yourself. And I think it's because we're not meant to do it for ourselves. (gasps) Oh, Kristen, <laughs> mic drop moment. Yes, but we because if we were meant, we would be able to do it. Yes, and then we wouldn't need each other in the first place, and we could just sit on our own and we could solve our own problems. But it's easier for us to do it for someone else, and we have to learn to let other people do it for us. Yes, and it really is that community that pulls us forward. And helps us to progress all together when there isn't a, you know, a competition or a keeping up with the Joneses or like, I'm too embarrassed that this big thing happened in my family or whatever, but just, I'm a real person living real life and real life is really hard sometimes. And then it gets better and we can cheer each other on for that part when it's better and right. you know, be able to, oh, you know, I think it's important in our community to be able to not just grieve together, but to celebrate. Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry. Time we're going off. No, <laughs> it's fine. Okay. It's fine. From one you mom know. in a minivan to another. Let me turn off. Absolutely. Except I'm in the 12 passenger. No minivans in this place. <laughs> oh, I love that. I needed to hear that because I mean, you know, maybe we'll get to this with the questions that we discuss, but I feel like I'm kind of at a crossroads right now with communities of having to make some hard decisions about like, am I safe and how safe and just really, really wanting to pull back. And, you know, part of that, I think there is some wisdom in that and needing to hold some uncomfortable boundaries right now. Um, But then part of it, I think maybe I'm going to challenge myself a little bit there and push on that, that that's not going to benefit me 
to just totally cut myself off from as many people as I feel like I want to right now. So I needed that reminder. (laughs) And I think it's okay to also, you know, be around people who are going to be careful with your flame and with your light. And so using your community wisely, and sometimes it's good to pair back your community. You Mm -hmm. know, maybe the community was really expansive and it had hundreds of people in it. And maybe now it needs to have five people in it. Right. But it needs to have some people in it. It's not. Yes. (laughs) That's the piece I needed to be reminded. It's like, it needs to have some people in it, Katie. (laughs) <laughs> Even well, though I'm like, I, are you sure? I'm an introvert. I would be happy to just like hide under my covers and Amazon Prime, you know, for the rest of my life and never leave my house. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. No, I spoke no, I think that's that's so important. So, what does community mean to you, and what communities do you feel like you're a part of now? Whether it's bigger or smaller in real life, like in your neighborhood, you have people that are around, where are you finding community now? Ooh, so I feel like I'm kind of, again, in a little bit of an in-between space because I felt like, similar to you, before recent years, like I could find community with anyone and how I would have defined it. And I don't know, maybe I still would, but just that common ground the commonality that even though each of us are different because we've had different upbringings, we have different beliefs, we have different cultural influences, we have different genetics, no two people are alike. Yet at the same time, we always have common ground. And so before recent years, like that was something that came really easy for me to find community with anyone And so before COVID hit, like I had so many different communities, so many in-person communities as well. But then as we went through COVID and Kristen, you know this, but we've got one of our kiddos was born with a airway malformation. And so his airway is more narrow naturally. And we're pretty lucky compared to other people with this condition. But as long as he's healthy... We don't even, you know, think about it, but as soon as he gets sick, respiratory infections swell his airway closed. So even when he was a baby, when he would teeth, that would be enough inflammation that it would swell his airway closed. So I'm sure you can imagine, you know, going through COVID, everybody I think was impacted in so many different ways and obviously not all the same ways. They didn't all overlap. And so I think, you know, a lot of people can relate with how shut in we all were, you know, at different points, but with our family, it was extreme. And so that, that really shook community for me, just that experience alone, because there were many places that we expected to be able to like physically go, but couldn't always count on those communities or there were places that we knew we couldn't go but we would like to but we couldn't and for us where our situation was so extreme like we we had about an eighth month an eight month period where our pediatrician had us keep our two youngest kids out of all indoor public spaces and then two of those months overlapped with we had really bad fires that summer So outdoors, it was so smoky. Like I couldn't take my kids anywhere public indoor, but I couldn't take them outdoor. Like it just was so isolating, challenging. So I feel like, you know, community shifted so much and many of us can probably relate. We went online with a lot. And I think there were, I can also say there were challenges, but there were so many heartwarming things. Like for example, as we shared with our kids, friends, like, Hey, this is our situation. So many of them are so kind and would do zoom play dates with our kids, like long before everybody else was back to in-person. And then once we got the clear to start doing, you know, more in-person, their friends would come over and like, it might sound so silly, but to me, it was so heartwarming that we'd go to answer the door and they would just have a mask on because they knew that's what we needed. And the point that we were at with, you know, resources 
and knowledge and information and such. That's the point that we were at, even though nobody else in the neighborhood needed that, but my child needed that. So to answer the door and they just knew, you know, cause we'd explained there were so many heartwarming things too, that I feel like in parts we saw kind of the worst of humanity, <laughs> but in other parts we saw the best and people were going out of their ways, you know, to include so how community currently looks, again, I'm still kind of up in the air because that was so jarring to go with the belief of, oh, I can find community with anyone. And then to go through these years where we had to pull so back in order to take care of ourselves and and not everybody could meet us there in the understanding that we had, that it's like, we're not trying to make a political statement. We're not trying to annoy people. We're not trying to make people's lives harder. We are literally following our doctor's instructions to care for this child and the body that he has and the health needs that he has. So now community currently looks like still a lot of online I feel like one blessing, it really opened my eyes to see how much is available beyond physical communities. So I am a member of several Facebook groups or forums. I do weekly group therapy on Zoom. I do weekly private therapy on Zoom. It's just amazing. And right now, like we've alluded to, I feel like I'm in a season with smaller community, even though I do really enjoy posting on social media and interacting with people in that way. In real life, my community is really small right now. I have one best friend. We meet up. We, we shoot for once a week. It doesn't always work. Moms to moms, right? But we meet up at a cute little tea shop here in town and we have herbal tea and we talk for an hour or two. I've got a couple best friends that I text regularly with or Marco Polo or audio message with. But other than that, like I don't have a lot of in-person community besides like I do go to church, you know, but I don't have other in-person, in real life, face-to-face -face community right now where I feel like our needs just earthquaked the previous communities that I had face-to-face -face and in person. So yeah, I don't know if that makes any sense. It's messy and it's so painful and I'm still kind of in the middle of trying to figure out like what we were saying. Like I feel like I was in a season before where having big communities and multiple and lots of face-to-face, -face, it was working for me. But now I am in a season where my my needs and my family's needs aren't lining up with everybody and again just needing to be safe and a little bit protected in several different areas right now and I have not figured out how to do in real life face to face where some of those needs are very specific so the advantage of online is there's more people who are having some of these similar experiences to be able to support so that makes a lot of sense. And I think also, at least in, in my experience, there is a small degree of anonymity that you get from having online connections, which when you think about when we were all like young moms and, you know, some of our listeners will still be young moms, but you can talk about potty training woes with anyone and there's no like you know, judgment from society because your child is struggling to, you know, be potty trained or whatever. But as your children get older and they're, you know, tweens, teens, young adults, often the struggles are way bigger in, in a way that you want to protect the privacy of your children. But as moms, you still need some community and you need to talk about what you're experiencing but for me, you know, some of my kids have been through some pretty major things. And I don't want to post about that online. I want to honor the space for them to work through these things and learn from the various challenges and, and trials that are before them without feeling like all the neighbors know, for example. You know, it can make it, it can sometimes make it harder or make people feel stuck in 
like being defined by the most difficult things they've ever faced when we want to be able to have a community that's growth focused and in our family to be able to say, yeah, this, these hard things have happened and what's coming next. You know, we have, we haven't managed this yet, but we will, or we're ongoing and we're working through. And so sometimes it's tricky to figure out, you know, how much to share. And I know, you know, one of your children has in particular been through some things that you've shared in some spaces and probably not in all spaces and learning how to support them as a mom while still getting some mom support. You know, it's just, it's, it's tricky to navigate that. And I think those online communities can provide safe, anonymous in the way we don't want the an, an anonymity in a way that promotes bullying or like I can be a keyboard worker, but in a way that as I can protect my family's privacy when needed and still have a space that's safe. I so resonate with that. And I think, you know, in a perfect world, we would never be judged for something that we're going through as moms or as a support person or what our child is going through, but unfortunately it's not true. So it can be really painful that in the process of trying to find community and trying to, you know, cry out and say, Hey, I need some support right now. Unfortunately, we do have to go past people who will be judgmental and will say things that are unhelpful to hurtful. And so there is so much wisdom in using the power of technology to find those people who are less likely to judge because they themselves have been or are going through similar. And that is exactly the benefit that I've had with these online communities in recent years, because the challenges that I've been going through are so specific and yet really harrowing and really big. And not every person who I walk past in real life can be responsible with that information. But again, I do need support right now and I am working through things and I am sorting out things. So yeah, thanks for reflecting that back because, you know, as I'm telling you about community, ironically here, you're like, I've been feeling shame. Like I feel shame and guilt that I've spent so much of my life with face-to-face -face community being a priority and for whatever weird reason, until you reflected that back to me, it's like I felt apologetic somehow that I've shifted and that I'm taking my time and my attention away from having a huge face-to-face -face community and multiple communities. And I'm saying, no, I'm scaling that back and I'm pouring that into these specific areas and primarily online so that the people can hear what I'm going through and they're not peeking out their blinds, you know, watching me or whatever, judging me. I can't deal with that too right now and the challenges that I'm problem solving. So thank you for holding space for that, Kristen. But and hopefully the listeners can relate. I, I think they can. And we, you know, I just this last week launched a Facebook group that's kind of helping us ramp up to the launch of this podcast. And really my vision is that we'll have this group, but I would love for it to grow and spill into some in real life groups in areas across the country oh, or okay. beyond that, where yes. there are small groups. Like you talk about going to get, you know, tea with your friend and being able to have that in real life connection that we could have some of these smaller little pods, but that are coming from, even if we're not, going through the same specific things, which I think you're alluding to mm -hmm. some of these Facebook groups being very like uh, situationally right. specific, but mm -hmm. that there's this general feeling of being able to hold space for each other, to be vulnerable, to be non-judgmental, so that even if your challenge isn't the same, that you're met with someone who's mm -hmm. coming from that same energy of being able to say, okay, well, I don't have a kid that's doing that, but I can actually think about what that might be like and I can hold space for you and I can be very outward mindset focused and and see what that's like for you and so that it brings us together rather than being divisive because I know one of the themes right. that you in all of the masking and whatever it did become very political where we lived 
And it became yeah. very, like, if you're telling me to mask, it's because you don't honor my freedom and because they're whatever, all these things. And I can see the value in some of that because some of the situations where our kids were told to mask, but then not mask, it didn't make any sense to me yeah. where I was like, we're not even being <laughs> cohesive in, in our standards. Right. We're saying, okay here, but it's not okay here. They should either both be okay or both not be okay. It just it, right. it wasn't done in a very logical way. And and but what what you were looking for is for people to say outward mindset focused. Yeah. This particular family, it doesn't even matter what the rest of it was. This family, this isn't about making a political stand. This is about a family with a child who was born in a compromising situation with an airway that just doesn't function the way like most people's would. And so this specific child's doctor had recommended this specific course. And can we show up for a family? Yes. Because that's what we would want someone to do for us. And even if you hate wearing a mask, masks were like very hard for me, sensory oriented. And so mm. I only wore them at times where it was either required or in a case like, you know, with a family like yours. Right. And I think if you don't have sensory issues, you don't realize what that could like, just how hard it can. Yeah. It was very hard for me right. to wear. And for other reason. It sounds for like other... whiny. Yes. Or some people have had traumas that contributed to why wearing a mask was difficult or whatever. Right. But, but can we show up in community when we have someone who's in need and be focused on them? And that's really what we're kind of looking for in building community is people who can just show up for each other. What would you say have been things that people have done or said to you that have been the most helpful as you've been facing this last you know, year or two of a lot of really big trials? I think, Kristen, you hit on the heart of it. It's, it's not that I expect everyone to always agree with each other. Again, as I said a few minutes back, we're different people. We come to different conclusions. The question is, do we have the skills? And if we don't, can we develop those skills to sit in that with somebody else? so that we can set aside those differences or resolve them so that so that that's not even the issue so that we can be showing up heart to heart so at the at the heart of what some of the best ways that people have shown up for me and my family it's it's that i can tell you some really sweet stories we moved 2 years ago and when we moved in to our new neighborhood the church congregation we were coming to, there was one other family, different situation, different details, but they also had a child that they had to keep home at that point. And when the woman who was over the children's organization for our church found out, she held a special class for that family's three kids and my family's two kids. And she would prepare the lesson ahead of time, special for these kids. Often there would be, you know, handouts or some sort of an activity. And, you know, it wasn't long, maybe 20, 30 minutes. But all five of these kids were just bouncing up and down so excited because their family had been so shut in as well. But it was like, you would do that for my kids? Like, what? That's amazing. You know, other things that we haven't talked about yet, but. We, I know you know this, Kristen, we have a kiddo who came out as non-binary about a year ago, and I had written a post on Facebook maybe about a month ago on my personal account, but just talked about how somebody from our church congregation um, stopped by and dropped off cookies to celebrate when my kiddo's legal name change was finished because that person had had a, a close person in their life that had gone through the legal name change, and for my child, that was like, oh! <gasps> you see me and it's like okay it's quote unquote just a plate of cookies you know or going back to you know my kids with their lesson like it's just a 20 30 minute lesson but to my kids and to my family that was like so huge so i think sometimes we can get super in our heads when we we hear that somebody's struggling or we're aware that they're struggling. And sometimes as we get in our heads, we can be paralyzed by like, I don't want to say the wrong thing, or I don't know what to say, or maybe even I don't agree with that. Like, I don't agree that 
you know, their families back to wearing masks again, COVID so long over. Well, yeah, but we've got other respiratory infections. And again, this is what our doctor said. Yes, it's fall 2023. And we are back to masking again, you know, or like, how dare she support her child to have a legal name change? You know, like we can get so hung up on the issue or paralyzed that we say nothing or we do nothing. And I think the opposite can be so powerful when we just reach, like having that congregation member yesterday at church tap me on my back and say, how are you really doing? Or a plate of cookies or, you know, it doesn't have to be huge, but often it's just the fact that we're reaching and we're making efforts. I've loved watching people say to my child, like, help me understand how you experience gender. What is that like for you? Those types of questions, like we don't need to show up with a plate of cookies or a loaf of bread. We don't have to have something in hand, (laughs) you know, to show up for people. And so I think like those open-ended questions have been so powerful. Like, like asking, like, what does your family need? Like, is there something we could do so you guys could participate and leaving it open-ended and being comfortable enough with ourselves that we can show up for other people like that and ask those kinds of open questions and have the emotional maturity to understand again like like I've said already multiple times in this interview we're different people we aren't going to navigate life the same we're not going to come to the same conclusions even if we feel like we have pretty comparable or pretty similar lives we're different people And if we don't have the emotional maturity, we don't have the skills, it's going to blow up about the issue or the thing. And we're going to be judgmental and not even know that that's what we're doing. So I can tell you, you know, other stories from other seasons of my life, but I would say that's at the heart of it is showing up, being curious, being willing, acknowledging so often when people are going through major stress we can't usually take things from them. Like, you know, I feel like with what I've been through, we've had, my oldest was in treatment for generalized anxiety disorder about a year ago. My husband was in the same treatment program for OCD. I didn't know before that how helpful it could have been to say, do you know what? I'm dropping off of of frozen lasagna or I'm I'm dropping off sandwich fixings. Let me know if there's any allergies like done. Here it is. You know, sometimes we can do some of those logistical things, but I feel like when we're going through major stress, most of it can't be given to anybody else. But what we can do is sit in it and offer a pair of listening ears and offer a heart that is willing to ask what is what has that been like for you and to just hold compassion and empathy it doesn't take a lot of money it doesn't take a lot of time it doesn't you know have to take any money at all it doesn't have to be a big grand production but it's just those small ways that people reached out that that felt like a lifeline especially in the past few years as i feel like so many of our communities that we've felt like we've been a part of previously have just crumbled underneath our feet so yeah there's a million things I probably could tell you because again we've seen so many heartwarming things but just reaching because okay I hear I thought I was winding down but one thing and then I'll wind down because otherwise when we say nothing and when we do nothing because either we're shocked or we don't agree we're offended we're judging whatever the reason whether we intend to or not, that sends a message. And often to the person who's struggling, stressed, hurting, it sends the message of, we don't care. You don't matter. It can feel very shaming when you're like, hey, I am part of this community and you've heard I'm struggling or I'm part of this community and I've told you I'm struggling. And there's silence. That silence can be so deafening. And I think most people would feel terrible if they could make that connection. They would never want to send that signal to another person, especially somebody who's struggling and especially somebody who has already been part of their community. But so often that is the message that, again, I believe is unintentionally in most cases 
But that's the message that gets sent is you're here, but we're going to pretend you're not because you, you don't matter or you're like, you're asking too much. You shouldn't have spoken up. You should be able to figure this out on your own. We don't want to send that message to people within our reach. I so as hard as it is to speak up, we need to, we need to do something. Go ahead, Kristen. I was going to say, I love, I love what you're saying. I think that more often than not, people who aren't speaking up, they are paralyzed by doing it wrong. Because right. what if I say something offensive, you know, this, this family has this non-binary child. If maybe I don't understand what that even means. And so what if I say something and now it's offensive and I don't know what to do. So I just sit quietly in my house feeling mm -hmm. like that is going to be helpful because I'm not like making it worse. Right. Because I'm not saying rude and judgmental things, right. which obviously that's like the worst <laughs> is if you're, you're saying yes. these horrible right. things out loud, that's going to be the least helpful thing you can do. But silence isn't helpful either. Being able to reach out. Right. What I'm hearing you say is that it isn't about the plate of cookies and it isn't about the mm -hmm. eating and that what it is, is it's about being seen by someone whose heart has a desire to see you and you feel seen with these actions and you feel seen when someone says, tell me about what you're experiencing without actually having come to, you know, a conclusion about what they think you're experiencing. <laughs> Cause sometimes, <laughs> and I occasionally do this even, especially with my children or someone that I know very well, I'm like, tell me about it, but I've already decided how I think they're experiencing it. <laughs> And then I have to step back and be like, well, but wait a minute, you tell me about it without me having decided what I think you're actually experiencing first. Well, and Kristen, I think in some cases I can, I have found it helpful to preface with like, correct me if this isn't right, but I'm wondering if maybe it might be blah, 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 blah. Or again, now that I've had family members in mental health treatment, like to just be proactive and say, hey, I'm dropping off a frozen lasagna. Would four o'clock be better or five o'clock? Like I can anticipate a little bit of how people might be experiencing it. But I feel like when I leave the door open to say, you know, let me know if it's different than this. But what I feel like I'm hearing you say is da, 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 da. or touching that part of me that's been through something comparable enough that I can think back to, you know, I'm thinking of, I was on bed rest for three of our pregnancies. Like I've had that life experience. So when I hear that people are down for whether it's a pregnancy or another reason, I can think back and be like, okay, what were the most helpful ways that people showed up for me? Or I wish they would have and offer that proactively because sometimes when we're going through something stressful, I don't know about you, but like, it's overwhelming. And there's people who are like, well, let me know if you need anything. And it's like, okay, if I can sort this all out and figure out where the needs are, there are tons of people who would love to help, but that's putting it on me to figure it out. And sometimes I can, but sometimes I'm drowning. So I think, I think there can be power in that, especially if it's like our kids, like you said, somebody that we know well, but I think if we leave that door open to say, correct me, I want to hear if it's different than this, but I'd imagine it maybe, is it like this? Are you maybe feeling this? Would this maybe be helpful right now? Rather than leaving it open-ended and like, I feel like for me, that's more heartwarming too. And then I feel comfortable to say to the person, you know, I could see that, but no, actually it's like this for me. Or like, it's kind of like that, but it's also this. Because there's when an approach the asking that it yeah. is. Like, so I see you experiencing this, but it's like, I'm seeing you and I'm thinking you might right. be experiencing this, which could be almost yeah. a little bit the Brene Brown, the story I'm telling myself, you know, the story I'm telling That's myself cool. about your experience is this. Yeah. Is that accurate? And if it's not, yeah. accurate, let's like open the door and tell me where I'm, where I'm missing it. And yes, what totally. I can do differently or see differently. I love that you also touched on being able to sometimes show up with a meal or with something or to reach out. I love that you're reaching out in advance. I'm going to drop off this frozen lasagna or let me know if there are any allergies because you never right. know. Sometimes people have crazy allergies and you don't want to do that, but that you are kind of taking a little bit of the emotional labor 
I don't know yeah. why I am so sick of deciding what's for dinner. <laughs> like, right. It's like the worst. And I know there's people in my family who are quite capable of making dinner, but I actually don't care if someone makes the dinner as much as I care about deciding what's for dinner. Right. <laughs> that is the hard part at this point. Like, I don't know yeah. anymore. Can we just eat cereal every night? Like, I don't even know. But but your kids are eating. Go mom. Cereal counts. <laughs> Pasta, whatever, you know, whatever we need to do for sure. But but being able to kind of take some of the emotional bandwidth. Yeah. yeah. On for and someone else. Can I can I acknowledge there, Kristen? That was not a skill set that I started my adult life with. It was again, especially having three high risk pregnancies where I was on bed rest for months at a time and watching people do that. Like they'd call me and say, Hey, Katie, I'm about to head to the grocery store. What can I pick up for you while I'm there? And of course I have groceries I need picked up, but for me to have to, like, I love how you said that emotional labor. It's like for me to have to be like, Oh my gosh, if I call her, I know she works So she probably won't have time. Oh, she's got little kids. She said she's willing. She said, let her know if I need anything, but I feel bad. And then I've knocked everybody off my list, you know? So watching people show up for me in those proactive ways that for me, that was very comfortable. But again, I think it's not comfortable for everyone. So to present them with an out, (laughs) you know, (laughs) to say, Hey, I'm being more on the proactive end rather than definitely not passive, but is this okay? Or this versus this gives them an out. If they're like, actually, we hate lasagna, you know, or like, oh, we're not home tonight. Then being proactive. I learned that because people did that for me, Kristen. So that's a skill we can develop. And I think... So many of these skills that we're talking about today, unfortunately, most of us don't, they're not even on our radar until we ourselves have gone through heartache, trauma, grief, stress, crises. And then we learn to take on those skills because they've been modeled to us. So it would be amazing if people are listening and they're like, oh, that's a good idea. And they don't have to pay the price of going through something crappy (laughs) to learn you know, some of these ways to reach out when people are struggling and to, to create that community both ways. And you know what, Kristen, can I say one other thing? I learned on the opposite end where so many people do want to help, you know, and again, we alluded, sometimes that's overwhelming when you're drowning in life. It took me until my third baby that I was on bed rest, that third pregnancy before I was like, oh, I should just make a wish list. And so I sat down with my husband and I'm like, okay, if people call you or text you and ask what they can do, let's like make kind of a smaller, you know, easier thing. And then let's just put a couple of the big things that would be like amazing, but you know, people might not have time. And I cannot tell you how cool the feedback that people gave us, like, thank you. That helps so much. Like we really want to help. We really we really care. And in that particular life event, I was clear headed enough. I wasn't, you know, as overwhelmed with the emotions and all of the logistics where this was our third pregnancy. We'd been on bed rest. We kind of knew the routine. So I could do that. And I don't know if you remember, I had surgery this summer and I did something similar post-op. I was like, here's our wish list. If anybody's interested and available, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this. And I think it can help as we're trying to build community either way. Part of it is like speaking up when we need help and then also showing up when people need help. And so I think we can take some of the emotional labor out of it that maybe culturally, traditionally, we've felt for whatever reason, we have to be more private or more ashamed. And I get some people might want to be more private, but that can help so much for needs to get met when we don't feel apologetic about being proactive in asking for help or being proactive in giving help. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. I, I think about when I first learned about Brene Brown talking about like, until we can accept help and I'm paraphrasing, but without judging ourselves, essentially, we're basically not capable of loving other people without judging them. And I was like, 
I felt so I called out by that for a long time. I called that a stupid truth where to me, a stupid truth was something that <laughs> true, but that I was being called out on. And that's why it was stupid to me because I was like, I do not want to face that layer of personal growth right now. I just want it, you know, cause I felt like I could show up mm. for everyone. And that was something that came right. easy for me. And I do have a gift to be able to kind of see the needs of other people and be able to fill mm -hmm. those needs in unique ways. But I am not good ex at accepting help and I'm not hard. reaching out. And yep. so when I heard that from Renee Brown, it was basically like, if you can't accept the help without judging yourself, you know, you're, you are having a little bit of judgment for these people that you're helping. And I was like, yeah. Maybe I'm like not Dang. like not but like you know they need my help like I'm a little bit of a savior complex like I can come yeah. in and can provide this help and support but that's not real community either because real community no. ways and yeah um, amen, a little bit from a Christian viewpoint for me studying the life of Jesus Christ and being able to look for the times where a woman, you know, was anointing him with these expensive oils and he didn't say, don't do that. Or he comes to the woman at the well and he says, Hey, I'm thirsty. Yeah. Like, Garden of Gethsemane. And he's like, I would like you to go with me, come and watch mm -hmm. me. You know, friends, they fall asleep. They're maybe not showing up for him the way he hoped, but right. he reached out and actually asked oh, I love that. him. And I was like, Oh, Okay, well, we talk so much about in Christian communities about serving like Jesus, but when do we talk yeah. about being served like Jesus, accepting oh, service like so Jesus? Cool. How many meals did he eat that he didn't prepare or pay for or provide? Right. I would think quite a few actually during his yeah. ministry, you know, as he left his profession and he was out. So do I let people oh, serve? That's cool. And that's been kind of opening that up for me to be like, no, this isn't, I have identified an area of growth. <laughs> well, and Kristen, I, I love that. And as you're talking, I so like, I love the times when I get to be the hands. And for me, I feel like there is just such a special feeling when I, when I find out somebody's in need and I'm like, oh. I can do this. Like I can help meet that need. I have that resource, whether it's time or patience or a physical, you know, need, like it's such a special feeling. And so when we are struggling and we're hiding under a rock in our struggles, again, I honor some people are very private, but it takes away those opportunities for people to experience the specialness of, again, in a Christian context, I believe we can be an extension of God himself. We are his hands when we show up for one another. And so we take that away from other people by being quiet. So I love like Christ-like service is that sometimes we are able to give, but also sometimes we're receiving because Christ is in both ends of that. So yeah, that's deep. Thanks for sharing that. You're so welcome. So a couple of questions that I want to make sure I've asked all my guests for fun. Tell me what you're listening to, whether on audiobooks, music, what, what do you like to listen to? Right now, lately, I've been listening to the Waking Up to Narcissism podcast by Tony Overbay. I would have to also make sure I get the title right, but it's by Dr. Romani. And it's it's got narcissism in the title too. Should I send you for the show notes? Sure. I'm, yeah. Yeah. I'm not a huge podcast listener. Here I'm a podcast guest. I don't listen to a lot of podcasts, but I'm listening to those too. Also, I'm going to put myself out there vulnerably for yet one more controversy, but I've been listening to Christmas music. <laughs> the um, day are, after Halloween. We already have all of our cheese up. up. We feel that. And so. I've, I've done that like the past maybe three or so years through started during COVID. It was like, we need Christmas early. <laughs> I'm listening to Christmas. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, I feel like those are the big ones that I'm trying to keep up with and catch. Yeah. So listening. And then did you ask reading or was that a separate question? If you have something, sure. Sure. Share what you're reading. We just, 
And Kristen, you joined the discussion for this. We just read No Divisions Among You, and that was so good. I loved that. And then I just started reading a book called Ignited. That one is a faith-based book as well. It's written by my dear friend, J.C. Whiteman, and it is just phenomenal. She talks about how like to handle those times when you feel snuffed out and depleted and how to ignite Jesus Christ again and keep that flame going. So I've really been enjoying that. Very timely because I think a lot of us have been feeling snuffed out. So that, that's a good I know. So yeah, go check that. Yes. Check that Tell one. Me, what is something that's interesting that's in your car? <laughs> we should like show a movie. I don't know. I should have cleaned out my car before this episode. Um, I've got a plant that's not dead yet from my <laughs> son's animal <laughs> class. I love it. That has made it out. I don't know. What else do I have in my car that's interesting? I don't know. Like, it needs to be cleaned out. That's probably the most weird thing. I love the that. The rest is just, like, candy wrappers. <laughs> that's my life. That's my, but I love that yeah, you have an I'll actual play. plant. An actual plant. Like, that's <laughs> that's pretty special. That's a little I'm proud fun. that it's still still alive because I kill plants. <laughs> yeah, that, so, there is hope for you. May, how many years ago would it have been? Maybe might have been as many as like eight to 10 years ago. One of my kids brought home a plant from school for Mother's Day that was like the little gift, you know, that they did and said, mom, do you want me to throw it away now? Or do you want to wait till it's dead? And I was like, oh, I'm so but I have now successfully oh. learned how to grow plants from seed. I'm still not big on flowers. But like I've grown pumpkins and tomatoes and different oh things. And I I like to grow them from seed instead of buying yeah. the plant already done because it makes me feel like powerful or something. I don't know. <laughs> yes. Go, Kristen. Seed of my kids. Well, I'll get there. So there's hope for you yet, but the fact, and I. Today, I feel the cactus. What, what was that? I don't that? know how that's possible. I kill the cactus. So it's going to be a ways out. That's awesome. That's awesome. I love it. So if you could have a gigantic billboard somewhere and you could send a message to the world, everyone in the world is going to see this. What do you think the world needs to know? So it would be Christian and we can adapt it non-Christian for your non-Christian listeners, but it would be, let's talk about trauma so that we can talk about grace. I believe that until we are willing to be vulnerable and open. And again, each individual has to determine what that level is. Before we hit record, we were talking about boundaries. We need hard boundaries to keep soft hearts. So it may not be equal with everyone, right? But until we're willing to go there, we can't talk about the hope. We can't talk about resources. We can't talk about change until we're willing to acknowledge the hard parts. So let's talk about trauma so we can talk about grace. I love that. And I love that you're including both because I think sometimes we, we feel torn because we don't want to be toxically positive because toxic positivity is basically (laughs) trying to talk about just the grace, but without the other part, it's kind of empty or to the other side, there are people who get so invested in working through trauma that they also can get mired in the trauma. And kind of stuck in it and stuck in the more negative part of it. And we really need them both. We need to be able to look at both sides and the whole picture and to be able to say, this is really hard. And this is what it looks like. And this is what it is. And also there's hope and there is still positivity. And there are still, you know, to quote Fred Rogers, look for the helpers. There are still the helpers, yeah. you know, in any tragedy but we're not going to not acknowledge that the tragedy happened, that we have to be able to hold space for both of those. I think that's so beautiful. And, and that is where real safety, that's where real authenticity comes in is right? being able to look at truth, all the sides of the truth and, and yeah. hold up and look at it and work through it together. I think that's really powerful. powerful. So Is there anything in, I know in the past, we even came as clients at one point when you were doing 
quantum neural reset therapy. And I know you've done a lot with yoga and there have been other places. Are are there business offerings that you have right now that you would want people to be aware of? Where can they find you? Thanks, Kristen. Yeah, I did hit pause on my small business for a couple of years where we've had so much, but I am getting back into it. Yay. So I do have some pre-recorded classes that are yoga or trainings right now that are available. Some are even free. And then I have recorded, I don't know if you saw on Facebook, I showed a few pictures from the footage, but I've recorded a bunch of yoga classes and I will be releasing 14, hopefully in the next couple months, that'll be two different series. And then I will be working with live yoga and meditation students again. And then right now I'm working on an advanced coaching training. I'll be working one-on-one with clients in the aftermath of relationship trauma. It's based on neuroscience and somatic movement. So I'll be opening up my calendar for that in a couple months for some live practice clients. And then I'll be trained and certified by the spring. So if you want to check that out, I am on Facebook and Instagram. Both are grace-filled pathways. And then my website where I've got the pre-recorded things and the future pre-recorded things will go and the coaching, you can sign up there as well. It's gracefilledpathways.freshlearn.com. And then if you don't mind, one of my dear, dear, dear friends has a book coming out called Healing in Christ Light. And she she's a professional voiceover, just like amazing person and has a has has had a podcast that goes with her book. She just invited me to co-host. So if you want to hear about healing in Christ's light, when there are destructive patterns in relationships, then my friend Jenny Brockbank and I are over on healing, healing in Christ's light and releasing podcasts there. So I can send you links if you would like Kristen to any of those. Thank Thank you. I have to be able to offer those connections. And do you have one final thought that you'd want to leave our listeners with? Ooh, you know what? I would love to go back before we hit record. Kristen and I were talking about how sometimes some of us might struggle with having a soft heart and being open-minded to other people or being able to put our ourselves in other people's shoes. But I think we can go to the other extreme to where maybe that's not the challenge, but unless we can learn to have the boundaries that we need with different people and those boundaries are fluid, it'll change depending on who we're with or the setting or even within the same setting and the same person. Sometimes we can safely hold people closer than other times. So I would just say too, like, we don't need to be afraid to to realize that in some situations, in some settings, maybe it's not working and we're mismatched with that community and we don't need to feel bad or guilty and we don't need to be jerks and rude about it either, but to listen to our inner knowing and to not be afraid to walk away from a community so that we can turn and find a community where we can show up as our full selves in our full power and be able to tap into the power of connection and community to add our voice and our efforts to others so that we can pump out goodness and light together with other people. So sometimes it takes walking away from some communities and turning and finding the other We don't want to walk away and have no communities like you (laughs) called me out on, but walking away from the ones that aren't working so that we can turn to the ones that are. Well, and say this isn't a match and maybe it was a match for that time. Sometimes it isn't even a safety so much as I think sometimes we grow in different directions. You know, for example, you might meet people in a support group of some kind of trauma or grief or processing. And sometimes those people stick with you for a long time. And sometimes you reach a point where you're processing and you're growing forward from that. And it's hard to be connected from people that are, 
you know, it's still in the heaviness of it, if that makes sense. Like, not that we want to turn from them, but they might have to be bridging the gap to being able to the moving forward and finding people that we feel like we're really moving forward with as well. Because we reach that point right. at different timelines, you know, for whatever mm-hmm. thing we're experiencing. One of the things I really like that you brought out was listening to kind of that inner knowing. And one of the things I've always felt like with boundaries, people talk about setting boundaries. I actually don't think that we set boundaries. I think that we intuitively Mm -hmm. feel boundaries, that they're already there. Like there's a fence around my house. Oh, I love that. The boundary's there. I didn't, Mm -hmm. I'm not setting the boundary. We, We put the fence up because, well, we didn't put it, the previous owners did, but you know, like to mark where the property line was, but it's already there. I think for most of us, yeah. we feel when a boundary is crossed, the mm-hmm. question is, is, are we going to honor the boundary that we feel intuitively? Right. Not even a question of setting it, it's honoring it. And the boundary can change because mm-hmm. different people, different times, we're in a different space. Sometimes we're going through a lot of things and we just have a very limited emotional bandwidth. Right. So- some people we might have to back away from that require us to have greater emotional bandwidth for a time yeah. until we can kind of self-regulate ourselves again and work through some of that. And, and that can change and, and people can change people that maybe haven't been safe for us. They can become so because they mm-hmm. go through their own journey while we are. So it, it can be kind of fluid, but being able to just listen intuitively to your body and feel like, you know, is this, is this something I feel like is okay? Yeah. Learning to trust yourself and trust your gut, which can totally. be really hard. Sometimes we really second guess ourselves, but if you right. can feel, you usually know, and you can feel that. Mm-hmm being able to do that. So it has been such a pleasure to be able to have you. I am just grateful for any time we've had in discussion. I always feel like I walk away feeling uplifted, like I've learned or like I've been able to think about some things critically and know how I can better move forward. And I'm just really grateful for your time here. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And congrats on your podcast. Thank you. You did it. (laughs) We're here. We're doing it. Solidarity Sisters.